the publication that we're discussing today uh, regards new discoveries on ocean phytoplankton health. And these were made possible by the MODIS sensor on the Aqua satellite. All right, there's three primary results from the study. Uh, the, first, the first result is that uh, in analyzing the satellite data, we found a hidden signal in the fluorescence um, uh, data set. What we found is that areas of the ocean that have low iron levels also have high fluorescence levels. So what this means is that we can use the satellite fluorescence measurements to actually look at what parts of the ocean are iron limited on a global basis on a regular time scale and to see how these areas are changing. And what this means is it, it means that we have a new tool, um, a tool that helps us understand how ocean ecosystems function as well as how they respond to change. Before we did this study, uh, we already knew that phytoplankton are very sensitive to environmental change. We've published on that in the past. Um, but we can now uh, use the information to predict how future changes in ocean plants um, may occur. In order to do that, you need to understand exactly what resources limit the phytoplankton growth. And the new fluorescence information is what helps us here. Um, Scott's going to talk uh, quite a bit more about this in a few minutes. The second result from the study is that by linking iron stress to the satellite fluorescence signal, it allows us to actually discover new areas of the ocean where low iron levels are affecting the health of the phytoplankton. Um, in this regard, one of the big surprises in the Indian Ocean. Um, traditionally, we, we have thought about the Indian Ocean as having plenty of iron. But the fluorescence data is telling us that actually large areas of the Indian Ocean during the southern monsoon season, which is kind of during our summer and fall, is actually um, a period when the phytoplankton are starved for iron. And there were other surprises um, in the globe as well. And I won't get into all those. But what this is telling us is that there are major areas of the ocean that are actually working differently than what we had thought before. Okay. Finally, the uh, fluorescence data also helps us with estimates of ocean photosynthesis. And Rue will talk about this after Scott. Um, but just briefly, the fluorescence data gives us direct information on how efficiently phytoplankton are using the sunlight energy that they're absorbing for photosynthesis. And with the fluorescence data, we find that in the surface part of the ocean, um, the phytoplankton are only using about 20% of the light that they're absorbing, okay, which is a fairly small fraction. Uh, we can also use the, the iron part of the signal to help improve the models that we use for calculating ocean photosynthesis. And just as an example, if we make a correction only for the tropical Pacific area, um, make a correction for iron stress, we find that the models give us a carbon dioxide uptake by these plants that's about two gigatons lower than what we had earlier thought. Two gigatons. Gigaton is 10 to the 15th grams of carbon, so it's a fairly significant amount. OK, so now let me, those are the, the primary findings. Let me give you a little background information. Um, fluorescence in, from plants is red light that the plants are giving off. And we usually don't look at a plant and think of it giving off light. But um, all plants, trees, bushes, grasses, garden plants, and phytoplankton, absorb sunlight for photosynthesis, but they don't use all that energy. And some of the excess energy that they absorb is lost again as red light. And this red light that the plants are giving off is what we call fluorescence. And interestingly, uh, it doesn't matter if the plants absorb blue light or green light or red light or whatever. They always give it off as red light. Now, if you look at the, um, some of the images on the website that was prepared for this briefing, you look at figure four. There's a beautiful picture there of actual fluorescence coming from phytoplankton. This, is, this picture was uh, provided by Maria Vernet at Scripps Institute of Oceanography. It's a really pretty picture. But you can see the red glow from these chains or strings of phytoplankton. Okay? And that's the signal we're seeing from space. Now, one of the tricks about this is that that signal is very faint. It's a small signal compared to all the light that's coming out of the ocean. But the MODIS sensor unlike previous sensors, has special bands to detect that little signal. In the past, the satellite sensors have largely been engineered to give us information about how much phytoplankton there is in the ocean and where those phytoplankton are. But what was very cool about the MODIS sensor is that it was designed to give us information both on how much phytoplankton is there and information upon about the health of those phytoplankton. And this idea of getting health 
was linked to the idea that fluorescence given off by the phytoplankton changes as they become more stressed. In particular, stresses to give off more fluorescence. Um, we also put on the website video number one, uh, if you want to look at that, uh, an actual uh, video of a full year of the actual fluorescence, raw fluorescence data that we're getting from the MODIS sensor. And in this video, you'll see the green areas and the yellow areas, that represents high fluorescence, and the blues and the purple are where there's low fluorescence. And the patterns that you're seeing on the globe are reflecting how much phytoplankton is in the water, because that's the first thing that dominates the signal. More phytoplankton means more fluorescence. The information on the health of the phytoplankton is hidden in that signal. And the way you get it is you take that fluorescent signal you're looking at, and you divide it by the total amount of light that the cells are absorbing. And this is called the fluorescence yield. And there's a video of the fluorescence yield as well. This is the first time anyone's looked at fluorescence yield globally in a video, and that's video number two. Pretty cool stuff. So what that's showing you is a full year of fluorescence yields for 2004, and the areas that are red are the areas that are lit up with fluorescence. So they're, they're the high fluorescence yields, and these areas correspond to iron stress. If you look at figure one and two on the website, there's just a simple comparison there between the springtime fluorescence yields of the globe and the iron dust that's being deposited on the ocean in figure two for the spring. Okay, and what you see is that the red fluorescence yields, the high yields, correspond to areas that have low iron dust. Okay, so this is showing us that there's a correspondent. This is that iron signal I was telling you about. Okay, and as I mentioned before, we usually didn't think about the Indian Ocean as having iron stress, but during the south monsoon, the fluorescence data is clearly showing us that something's going on there, that, that there's probably very high uh, iron stress in that area during that time. The last couple comments I wanted to make are just kind of broader about the study. Um, the way I kind of look at this is um, kind of the long tail of two long historical uh, lines of research in oceanography. One of them is just what is the effect of iron on phytoplankton? What is, how do phytoplankton respond to iron stress? And that work has gone back for many decades and started in the laboratory. And we were looking at, well, what are the implications? How do the phytoplankton behave? And it's that basic work that was done in the laboratory and extended to the field that created the foundation of our interpretation of the satellite data. So this is a really neat example of how fundamental research leads to global understanding. I think that's really cool. And then the final uh, comment is that the uh, fluorescence, satellite fluorescence data also seems to be kind of a, a long tail for another line of research, and that's the idea that phytoplankton in the ocean might actually be limited by a micronutrient. Um, a long time ago, we never thought that was possible. But the first clear indications that iron are, is important out there were done um, in bottles. You know, these bottles are 200 mils or a liter. They're very small. And from those initial experiments, the concept grew to these enrichment experiments that, that there were got a lot of press where they added iron to the surface of the ocean, looked at the response. Those were on the order of square kilometers. After those, some new techniques came up that allowed us to look at thousands of kilometers of iron stress in the ocean. But the actual first time we were able to see this on the global scale is with the fluorescence data from satellites. And the reason for this is because satellites are so important um, as a way of looking at the global picture that we simply can't get from ships. It's impossible for us to actually cover the ocean by ships. There are parts of the ocean that we're seeing with the satellite fluorescence that are rarely, if ever, visited by research ships. So this is one of the reasons this is an exciting result. It gives us a real big picture.